Welcome to a Creative Approach Podcast. I'm your host, Karen Poirier Brody. I'm going to start the show today with an apology to my regular listeners if the show is a little bit late in getting posted. It's been a very busy week with fun creative activities on my part. I'm the physician co-chair of the Studio AMWA Committee of the American Medical Women's Association, and I hosted a paint night for physicians and trainees and presented an award during the annual meeting for our new artist in residence. And I helped manage our booth at the meeting where we featured some amazing white coat art from our physicians and medical students. We'll be posting photos of those on the American Medical Women's Association Studio AMWA site. We will also have some creative musical medleys there, too. I love being involved in the creative approaches of this group of professional women. However, things like that are exhausting, and one comes home to a lot of postponed tasks. Nonetheless, the podcast is important to me, and I'm getting it out to you as fast as I can. Today, I'm so excited to have as my guest, Keiko Elizabeth, a Los Angeles-based actress working in television, film, and theater. Keiko Elizabeth came to acting later than most, having worked as a middle school teacher in the San Francisco Bay Area with kids transitioning out of Juvenile Hall. I've known Keiko most of her life, yet I had some delightful surprises as I learned her story today. I'm so happy to welcome Keiko to discuss her creative approach. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a Creative Approach podcast. My guest today is Keiko Elizabeth, and I think the best thing is to just, first off, say hi, Keiko. How are you? Hello, everyone. Hey, Karen. And I'm just so glad you could join me today. And I was thinking that maybe the best introduction is for you to introduce yourself and tell the audience a little bit about yourself and what you do. Sure. So I am an actress. I think the term that people use is actor, the gender neutral for everybody these days. Um, And I live in the Los Angeles area. I work in theater, uh, film and television and commercials, mostly with my two kids and I wasn't always an actor, so we can get into the story of (laughs) (laughs) that transition probably later. So your your work is involved with mainly uh, the stage and television movies, right? Yes. You you don't have one single path, just a general life of an actress, which is great. And yeah, why don't you, um, I mean, I think I've known you for almost all your life. I know. (laughs) Maybe not the very beginning, but yes, uh, I've known you a long, long time. And uh, I think the audience, um, you've had an interesting uh, background uh, uh, and um, it might, we could probably just go back to the beginning because you were born here in um, south part of Sacramento, I think, right? Yeah, I was uh-huh. born in um, in Sacramento and my growing up, my parents and Karen were, were good friends and um, we would go over to your house, you know, every now and then. And you were the only person that I knew growing up who was a doctor. And that for a long time was what I wanted to do. And I was pre-med in college and a bio major. And I saw myself going to medical school and pursuing that path. And, and then, you know, life just intervened. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's different now in Sacramento, but at the time I don't really remember it having, I don't ever remember being around theater or drama or acting like at all. And you know, I've talked to my mom about it a little bit and she was like, well, there was just nothing really around to get you, you know, involved in. Um, and now there's some really great theater companies in Sacramento from what I've heard. And so it's a, it's just a richer, a richer environment, but I never been thought of doing something like that when I was little. So. I think that's true. I think there wasn't as much as there is now. I mean, there were a couple of little, um, theaters, but, I don't know that they had any kind of constant, you know, production schedule or anything. I mean, other than the music circus <laughs> or, uh, yeah. but now we have so many things to offer. So yeah, I suppose yeah. 
what kids are exposed to can influence uh, things at the beginning, but obviously that didn't keep you back. <laughs> so. well, you know, what's interesting too. I was listening to like the introduction to your podcast. Um, the first episode where you talked about um, medicine is storytelling. And yeah. I had never thought of that before. And I really think, you know, maybe if that had been something that was a little bit more part of my consciousness, when I was thinking about medicine, I might've stayed in that track a little bit, a little bit more. Um, so right. I think that's a really interesting idea. <laughs> well, but so much of it is, I think, you know, we do a history of present illness. We're trying to get at the origins of the story and the things that influence, because a lot of times people start with what their complaints is, and you really have to go back a lot of times to when they were perfectly well <laughs> and, and try and trace a little bit, because sometimes there's thing, insights that you just wouldn't have gained otherwise. But yeah, there is a, a narrative and an interesting thing in the art of medicine that the story often reveals a lot you know it's not just all the tests you do or um even what the current complaint is but you really have to get that bit of a, a history and story to really get things into perspective yeah, so I love it. Mm -hmm. but you didn't even think about going into anything scientific once you were finished with school right i mean you you studied that in college but You'd, yeah, you'd... by the time I had finished college, I, I knew that um, there were things about the medical profession, as I alluded to, that I just, I couldn't see myself fitting into that world. Uh -huh. um, at least at my college, I went to Stanford. It was very competitive. It was very, uh, it didn't really feel collaborative. People weren't really interested in healing. They were interested in um, sort of satisfying their own I don't know, uh, <laughs> ego, I guess, in a way. Um, and I, I didn't really, I wasn't interested in that. And then also when I was there, I had started tutoring children, middle school kids in the local schools around campus. And so I, um, I moved into teaching and I was a middle school uh, teacher for several years in the Bay Area in Oakland and San Francisco. And I worked with kids coming out of juvenile hall. And it was in that setting, actually, that I first was introduced to to theater, to the storytelling power of live theater. And um, I was working with at a school that's not even around anymore, but it was a trans a transition school for kids who were coming out of juvenile hall, um, but weren't quite ready to transition back into mainstream schools. And it was an arts based school in San Francisco. And it was this collaboration of like the mental health office, juvenile probation, the county department of education. It was this, all of these agencies had come together to really invest in an arts-based approach um, for rehabilitating these students and re-engaging them in education. And so I was the math and science teacher. And one of my students um, who was, she just had taken to me. Sometimes, you know, you treat students the same, but sometimes students, you know, will form a bond with somebody and that can be really important for their healing. So she, while she was at our school, her brother was shot and killed in a drive-by shooting in San Francisco, and we helped her write a play about it. And we, at the time, had, you know, a grant or something, and we produced her play. And she had, you know, she was 15, but she had like a fourth, or, she was special ed, she had fourth or fifth grade reading level, and she was like, this was probably the most complex piece of writing she'd ever done in her life. And we hired professional actors, and it was sort of a mix of professional actors and some of our students um, who came, and we invited a bunch of people, you know, from around the city to come to this production. It was a packed house, and um, and gosh, it was just so moving. I just remember standing at the back of the auditorium and watching these actors on stage telling this story that I knew really intimately, and just that it was so alive in that moment. And I was like that's what I want to do. <laughs> that's awesome. I mean, really, um, <laughs> what, what a way to, um, open yourself to that. I, I always, that's one of the things I've said here on some of the shows is just opening yourself up to the creative possibilities in life and, and staying open. And what, you know, there's a door that just opened <laughs> and gave yeah. you that insight. And, you know, I, I wasn't like a lot of people come sort of to the entertainment industry. If you could see me, I'm doing air quotes here. 
um, <laughs> you know, thinking like at, at 15 or they, you know, 18, by the time they're 25, that nobody wants to do it anymore. They think they're too old, blah, blah, blah. And it's a good thing I didn't know any of that. You know what I yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? um, yeah, you I, did come at it a little bit older than most people yeah, I think realize. And, yeah. That they want to be an actor. Right. And it's um yeah, I, I find that most people I talk to either, you know, it's a dream they had as a child and then they did something else and then they came back to it or they've been constantly pursuing it. But I, I really haven't um met anyone else who just sort of discovered it. <laughs> when, you know, and then after that, it was a couple more years until I did my first show, uh, my first theater show. Now, and, um, I just knew that it, that was what I wanted to do after that. Well, did you go and study that or what was the actual transition into acting after? I mean, oh. here you are, a, a math and science teacher in a school in the Bay Area. And then um, you didn't just all of a sudden show up in an audition or did you? Yeah, well, I um, huh. I had taken a break from teaching and I had moved to Hawaii. I don't know if you remember that when yep. uh, when we were living in Hawaii for a couple of years. And it was when we were there, I was like substitute teaching and working at a nonprofit. And, um, you know, I, ha I had some some space in my life. It was before I had before I had my son. And um, so I tried out for a local play. Oh, and it was the Wizard of Oz and we had to go up and sing in front of like a hundred people. And it was mortifying and <laughs> sort of terrifying and exciting at the same time. And it was in this really um, old historic theater in town. And, um, and I got a part in the show and I just remember showing up to rehearsal and, you know, I had to wear like a wig and the costumes and everything. And I was like, Oh my God, this is the best thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> It was so fun. And, um, and then I did, let's see, I did two more s plays within sort of probably a four month period. And, um, I knew that I wanted to, to, I wanted somebody to teach me what to do. So I applied to MFA programs. Um, and I got into my first choice MFA program at Cal State Fullerton. And so we moved from Hawaii to Fullerton so I could um, go to school there. And that was kind of my training. That's awesome. So, so that was a master's program. I mean, did you find that math and science helped you in any way? That's the question. I you have. know, <laughs> <laughs> everything helps you on the universal level, Karen. <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the, the idea, um, of transferable skills, teaching actually probably helped me m the most just because there is a performance element, um, when you're teaching, particularly middle school students. <laughs> um, I know I, I, you know, I have to tell you something here. I, I have always said that the salt of the earth are public health nurses and middle school teachers. <laughs> yes. I have so much admiration for those professions. <laughs> you know, with middle school, you either love it or you hate it. Uh -huh. And I found that I loved it. I mean, I think I was a middle school teacher for four or five years and I just loved the age. But if you don't, then it will be miser You'll be miserable. Yeah. And as far as the performance part, uh, I remember a long time ago, I was attending a series of lectures on um, design and knitting with Lynn Anderson, who's a an, um, knitter in the East Coast who does fashion design now and who had originally started off with some knitting books is originally from New Zealand. Lots of sheep there. I think knitting's pretty natural. <laughs> Although many of us learn knitting as children. But she that was one of the things that she had said that had stuck in my mind of how much um of teaching was a performance. And she she even pointed out like how she dressed and what she was doing in the classroom with us to to illustrate her point of how it was a performance. And that mm. we we would learn better if we were engaged and entertained and um that she had arrange things just so we would learn. It was a really interesting um, observation, I thought, from someone yeah. who wasn't an actress, but <laughs> who understood that point. Yeah, definitely. You know, there's something about standing in front of an audience and um, connecting with them that is really unique to the performing arts, you know? Yeah. So. Well, 
a, a, an audience of many versus our usual conversations of one and a few friends. Um, yeah. And that's, you know, you have, you're connecting. Well, one of the things I find here, I am talking with you and talking with a whole lot of other people be, who aren't here with us right now, but there is something about performance and about these kinds of conversations that's incredibly intimate and that you have to keep in mind that you're talking to someone who's, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one involved with you. Uh, in a funny sort of way, that it's not just um, a great, vast audience out there. Do you keep that in mind when you're doing things like television, or do you just focus on what you're doing? <laughs> yeah, you know, I definitely think that the best, the most charismatic, the most engaging actors are the ones that have an ability to, they're so present with just the one person that they're talking to, but at the same time, they re you really feel like they're speaking to you as an audience member yeah. <laughs> and I'm, the other person watching them feels the same way. And, um, and I think that that is something that, you know, is, is practiced. That's has to do with, you know, empathy and just recognizing the universalness of some of our stories that we tell. Oh, so true. Yeah. You know, now getting back to things. So you go to, You've done a little amateur productions. You go and you study um, in a master of fine arts program and, and learn some of the craft of acting. And then do you just look for auditions and throw yourself out there? Or how is it that you make that transition? Or are you doing some of that while you're studying? Can you give the audience a little bit of a sense of what's like to become an actress? Yeah, I mean, it's a tough it's a tough road for sure. Um, when I, my third year, so an MFA is a three-year program in general. And in the third year, um, we took a camera class and, um, I really found that acting for the camera was just really, um, I loved it and I love live theater. Um, but I, I just loved the intimacy, um, of that particular medium and the subtlety of the medium and the I just, I just really enjoyed the class. And at the end of the class, we um, came away with some clips of our work, which was really great because, you know, nobody in Los Angeles wants to see you if you don't have examples of your work, just like anything else, right? If you're, a, if you're, you need to have a portfolio or something. And for us, it's, um, it's film, it's film clips. And so then you just start, um, well, this is what I did, but I find that People generally do the same thing. Um, there's several services that you can put up a profile on. And then um, if you're looking for um, an actor, you can put your project and list the different roles you're looking for. And then actors who qualify can submit and then you audition people. And um, and so that's what I did. And I, it's, you know, it's mostly student projects at first, like free projects or really low budget projects because you're really just looking for um, that footage high quality footage that really shows what you can do. And, and then you can shop yourself out to agents. And then once you get an agent, then they can start submitting you for more, um, legitimate television and film projects. Um, not that those projects are, are small in any way, just to tell a, a really fun story earlier in 2016, I worked on, um, a film with JK Simmons and the guy who was directing the film had gone to film school at USC. And another person who was in the scene with us um, told me that he lives in San Diego. He's not even acting anymore, but that the director had cast him in his first student film as a student at USC. And since then, he has found a role for him in every single film that he's done, um, which I just thought was so cool. You know, it is, it's a very collaborative art form. It's not like, you know, painting where you just can make this um, really amazing work of art just on your own, basically. Um, for the work that we do, it really involves having a lot of other people there. Yeah, I think that's probably one of the um, most interesting things. I mean, one, certainly one can do a one-person show, <laughs> but even then you're dependent on all the other people around you. And yeah. that that's true of a lot of things in life, I think. Um, uh, a lot of us couldn't have done our jobs without wonderful people to support us. I mean, there's just yeah. no way you can do some kind of production. And even this little podcast that I do, um, without a lot of help, I don't think I could, 
uh, put this on. Um, yeah. You know, even this one that I'm doing on my own, I've really had to rely on other people. But I think that's true of any production, and it makes it a really interesting environment to work in when you have uh, that sense of, like, we did this. <laughs> it's a very wonderful sense of community, I think. Yeah, definitely. And so when you had finished school and you'd been doing things, I mean, some of these kinds of other little projects you talked on, I suppose, were small theater productions, um, little iTunes um, theater, uh, I mean, YouTube productions, things like that. Is that what you're talking yeah, about? Like that. The first job I ever booked out of, out of, um, out of grad school was a short film for... Um, at the time, it was called, it was like related to Hallmark. Now it's called Feelin, F-E-E-L-N. And it was like short internet videos, like three minutes long that you could purchase and then send to people that you knew as like inspirational videos. And um, so I, I show up to set. I have like a stunt double. There's like 150 people in the crew, like caterers, just like trailers and stuff for, the, all for this like three minute video. It was, it was definitely an eye-opening experience and, you know, really gave me a sense of like what goes into um, producing high quality work yeah. like that. So. And that wasn't something you really learned about in school then? No, uh-uh. Oh, well, that's interesting. So all that was new just when you started doing that kind of work. And then, of course, well, uh, the kinds of work that you've done since then, you've done, um, you've continued with some theater work, even though you say you really like the intimacy of film. I know you've done TV shows and things, but I, I um, you still continued with some theater work? I do. Yeah. You know, there's nothing like um, just being in the same room with your audience. And it's just like the, the story and you without all of like the the cameras and the crew and the mic person holding a mic over your face. Um, <laughs> You know, that just really lets that connection with the audience is there. Um, so I just love it. Yeah, I'm in a theater company. I'm a member of a theater company in Los Angeles called Theater of Note. And I'm actually starting rehearsal in a couple of weeks for, um, we do mostly new plays um, for the world premiere of a, a play by a playwright that I really like. Um, so so I'm excited, looking forward to that. But, you know, I have two kids, so it's very, t t theater is very time consuming. Um and so my husband is, <laughs> I have an agreement. I do generally like one theater production a year um, because, I mean, it takes between the first rehearsal and closing the final performance is, you know, three months, three right. and a half months. So, yeah, it's a lot of time and a lot yeah. of effort. And so are kids. <laughs> yes. And so how is that work-life balance? Do you um, I imagine there's a certain amount when you trying to work out schedules and, and stress involved in that, but do they know much about mom doing theater? You know, a little bit. I remember the first time um, my son saw me in uh, a TV show. My, the first, my first TV show was a spot that I did in days of our lives. And there was like some disaster scene and I was like, Oh, my son. And, and so oh, I remember was, that one. <laughs> and he was like, where's the boy? Where's the boy? Where's the son? He was like, That's all he wanted to know. He was like, he must've been three at the time. It was, it was really sweet. Um, um, not everything that I, that I've done, I would want him to watch, but yeah. Uh, that was, that was fun. And they've, you know, over the summer, especially daycare gets harder and there's no school. And so I have brought them to auditions before. Um, it's fairly, it's fairly common to bring your kids to a commercial audition for TV or film. It's a little bit more difficult. Yeah. Um, so they definitely know what I do. Uh -huh. yeah, I'd say the hardest part is just, is more the logistics of, of childcare. And, you know, I get an audition the day before, so I, you know, have to find something for my two-year-old, you know. Yeah, last stuff. minute stuff. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, that that is always a challenge for a um, mom who's working and dads who work, uh, yeah. <laughs> sharing those uh, child care responsibilities. Yeah. And, and you know, I have a um, I have a blog that I started for. It's called the Mama Actor, and it's for moms who are also actors and. We have a really lovely Facebook community around the blog. There's like 200 moms um, and we get together every month and it's just been really great. I, I started it because um, 
I was reading an article a couple of years ago about a woman who it's actually um, the mom of Jake and Maggie Gyllenhaal. Do you know they're sort of famous actresses? And at she must have been in her 60s at the time. She directed her first feature film and took it to Sundance. And um, I thought that was so great that she did that. She had worked at Sesame Street when her kids were young. And she was um, they were interviewing her in the L.A. Times. And she said, um, you know, there's an exquisite. This is exactly what she said. There's an exquisite selfishness required to be an artist and an exquisite selflessness required to be a parent. And sometimes the tension between those two, um, you know, you need other people to help you navigate that space of tension. And um, that really spoke to me. Oh. Um, I really felt like that. And so as a result of that, I was like, I want to find other moms who, you know. And so we, we get together and we just support each other. And um, it's, it's a great community. I really enjoy having the other moms who, are, who know the struggle. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. I love that inspiration. I think that's very, very insightful statement. And um, I'm glad you found a way to help bridge that gap. That sounds really great. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. You know, this whole sense of, uh, you know, the show is about creativity and creative thought. So uh, I think I was, you know, th it's obviously... You're working on a creation that someone's written. You add your interpretation. It, you know, it becomes a part of you. It's an interesting way of relating to other people, like you said, in the audience. So I was wondering if you could give us, share a few thoughts about your thoughts about creativity. Yeah, I mean, oh, I have so many thoughts about creativity, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, sort of what it it. You know, what kind of meaning, it, did it change anything in your life of how you looked at things, of how you feel about things? Is there, you know, anything that yeah. you could pinpoint there? Yeah, I mean, when, so as an actor, it's all of the things you said that, you know, we take a story that's been written for us. And well, there's a wonderful quote that's like, oh, gosh. It's by an artist who says that actually the parameters of the canvas make for better art, that when there's like no boundaries or no rules or no anything, that art can become sprawling. Um, so that is what the writing is for an actor. The writing is the framework, the, um, the you know, the life circumstances, the qualities. Um, and then you you sit with that and you bring your own interpretation to it. And what that does is, you know, I, oh, it's so hard to put it into words. There's an expansion that happens, you know, when I, um, for example, one time I had to go in for a TV show and I had to play the role of a, a college administrator. And this girl comes in and is describing to the administrator, um, that she was assaulted. And my character is, basically blows her off. And, you know, there can be like a resistance to being the bad guy or to finding that part of yourself that values, you have to, you have to really expand what your own point of view is and what your own perspective is on somebody's situation. It really calls upon the deepest, the deepest part of empathy that you have in order to be able to do that. And I find that every story that I get the opportunity to tell, that's that's what I'm doing. I often have wondered about that, how you can, you know, when you have something that's so um, antithetical to who you are <laughs> or your values and you have to act that part, just how you manage to, you know, find the truth in that and being able to express yourself and, and come off convincingly. Yeah, because the truth is really in the humanity of that person. And if that's a different, you know, perspective on life than what you have, we're certainly seeing that now with people have so many different, they're get, becoming so entrenched in their own perspectives that they're not able to expand and see something from another person's point of view or put, you know, the, the old saying of putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. Um, that's really an act of, of empathizing with somebody else and um, seeing what it might be like. What if I did have? this point of view, what does that, you know, what does that feel like? What does that, where did that come from? How would that influence what I do? So all of those things, um, 
you know, and that's, that's using your imagination every time we're empathizing with somebody else is putting ourselves imaginatively in their position. And that's what I do over and over again. Yeah. I think that brings a certain richness to our lives to be able to, uh, push our thoughts to being in someone else's shoes. Um, and perhaps that is a lesson we should all take is thinking, um, about that and it might help us all get along better of course and you have a family history of people with interesting experiences they live around the world and um it's not like you haven't been exposed to other ideas in your life yeah and um i think that too you know i think anything we do that that takes us a little past our own insulated little spot might help us um, gain um, more insight into not just other people but also ourselves don't you think yeah absolutely it really expands your sense of possibility um when you see somebody living a different life because naturally what we do is we see ourselves in others so I think that's that's really important. Yeah, that's probably how a performance really can can speak to us individually. As we watch something, we see this unfolding in front of our eyes and say, um, that's a bit like me or like someone I know and really yeah. relate to it on a, a very personal level. So that's kind of a, a fun thing, I think. Yeah. What, what a fun Especially way. Especially when there's a character who's very flawed and you're like, oh, but I like that person. <laughs> I kind of <laughs> maybe sometimes do that too, you mm. know. Well, we I all have our flaws. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we probably should, uh, you know, uh, we don't want to dwell too much on them, I suppose, but we should be somewhat cognizant of who we are and, and what some of our feelings uh, and uh, typical not necessarily the best response patterns are so we can maybe mitigate some of that effect on others <laughs> yeah because uh, you know we're we're not all 100 percent uh, goodness and light yeah you know <laughs> and, definitely to be learned from the stories that we watch yeah and sure. maybe getting some insight into how both our good behavior and our not so good behavior affect other people um, I think there's a lot to be learned from theater and, and um, watching um, television and uh, any sort of role-playing acting uh, can give us lots of wonderful insights. Now, um, oh, I'm having that kind of day where things, <laughs> thoughts sometimes are flying away from me. Oh, I, was I know there was something you said earlier that intrigued me. And I was, you said in like your first production, and then you had to sing in front of people. Now, singing has not been a huge, do you have, do much singing in your performances? That was a question that came to my mind, and yes, I didn't I mean, follow I through with it. Oh my gosh, I don't know how I managed to do that. <laughs> 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 um, but I did. And, uh, you know, I certainly didn't have like a solo in the show, but I think it was part of, um, an expression of beginner's mind in a way, uh -huh. you know, and, you know, I wasn't, a, I wasn't auditioning for Broadway, so I wasn't, I didn't have that kind of, um, stakes and I didn't really know what I was doing. It was the first time I'd ever done something like that. Um, so it didn't really occur to me that it was like, you know, something not normal. But once, but I would, I don't sing now. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a terrible voice for singing. <laughs> it would be so intimidating to me. It's That's why I asked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, just it was every now and then you're thinking in a conversation. Well, I got to go back to that and ask about that because that's kind of interesting because you hadn't mentioned anywhere in all the rest of the conversation about uh, other performing acting, like dancing, singing, other types of performing other than acting. Yeah, that was the only musical I ever did. Um, and I think I just, you know, I lived in a small town in, in, in Hawaii and um, there wasn't a lot of live theater. So I was just like, that was what I wanted to do. What's going on right now? Oh, the Wizard of Oz. Okay. Well, I guess I'll go out <laughs> for that. 
<laughs> you know, it wasn't at all like, ooh, what roles do I see myself playing? It was nothing like that. It was really just like, what's happening now <laughs> that well, I can participate in? Yeah, um, that's a good thing. Well, I have enjoyed this conversation. And even though I've known you most of your life, I've learned some interesting things about you. <laughs> and that's really cool. And I'm glad uh, I was somewhat of an inspiration in your early life for the, those kinds of things that you learned. And, and hopefully um, the whole math science kind of stuff was a, a very satisfying part of your life, even though you've moved on to acting. Yeah, no, it definitely is. It still is. And I I talked to my son. It's it's also great to have a background in just as I help my son navigate school and blah, 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 all of that stuff. So Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I know a lot of parents who feel really intimidated by that, and I am happy that I don't. Yeah, it, it's true. There, uh, I don't know. I might feel intimidated, but then you know, <laughs> time goes on, and you have to go back to try. But you're you've had the experience of teaching, so that helps. I think, yeah, because when and you're they're still young, so yeah. he's, he's just doing addition and subtraction right now. <laughs> <laughs> when he moves into higher math in high school, you may have a little then more. We'll see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think. Um, yeah, I have a niece who tutors uh, college and high school students and uh, just simply doesn't understand why people have problems, uh, you know, uh, who are uh, older would have problems with math and physics. <laughs> she said it just all makes sense. Yeah, someday she'll learn. She? <laughs> well, well, no, I mean, she's... Um, older now, but I, I think that chance, you know, young people's minds are, you know, they could click into it and she loves to teach them, but I think she, it, it sort of amazes her that as people go on in life, they kind of close their mind to math and science sometimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. for her, it just all makes so much sense. Yeah. But there is a certain logic in it that I do like about math and science. So she's probably right about it making sense. Yeah. Well, as I said, I enjoyed talking to you, but I'm sure our listeners would love to know more about uh, where to find you and uh, how they can learn about you. So you mentioned um, some of your activities, in your acting moms group and your um, theater work. And then uh, I know you have an online presence. So would you like to tell the listeners where they can find you? Yeah, I do. I have a website that I keep fairly up to date with different projects that I'm working on. And my blog also lives there. Um, it's just my whole name, KeikoElizabeth.com. Um, I'm also on Twitter. If people want to connect with me on Twitter, I love that. Um, it's just at I'm Keiko. I am Keiko. Like, hi, I'm Keiko. Um, and yeah, I think those are probably two of the best places. Oh, good. Okay. So folks can see. Uh, what you might be up to in your acting and things from going to your website. So that's great. And um, we, I've really enjoyed talking to you today. So thanks so much. Thanks for having me, Karen. It's a pleasure. Thanks so much for listening to a Creative Approach podcast today. I hope you'll subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher if you've not already done so. Please check the podcast out on the Facebook page where I keep you up to date on our latest episodes. And I'd love for you to become a member of the Creative Approach Podcast Facebook group, where you can share your thoughts and where you'll find additional news posted. Also, check out the website, www.acreativeapproachpodcast.com. My team and I are working on developing a great home for fans of the show. Keep an eye out for developments over the next few weeks. There's also a Patreon page tab for those who want to offer some monetary support to the podcast. I'll talk to you again with another interesting guest on our next episode and sign off today with best wishes in your creative approach to life.